Thank you. Um, Thank you for that introduction, Roni, and, um, and hi, everyone. I'm kind of sad that I can't be with you in person. It looks quite quite nice. Um, there will be a, a Zoom talk, a slightly disembodied feel, but um, hopefully we'll get a chance to have a little bit of a, um, a conversation as well as we go along. Uh, what I can see from here is a room with some uh, ominous dark silhouettes, uh, some of them are apparently drinking coffee and waving, and that's all good and fine. Uh, but um, yeah, that's an <laughs> okay. That's great. You're also alive. That's that's fantastic. Uh, probably conscious as well, even though it's early in the morning. So um, I'm really pleased to speak to you. And uh, what I've asked to talk about is an introduction to the predictive processing framework and its relevance uh, to consciousness science, which I know is the is the focus of your winter school there um it will be a fairly high level um, affair uh, and hopefully i'll along the way drop enough anchors that you can kind of um, use in order to navigate a little bit of the debate uh, uh, such as it, it stands uh, today um so the plan for the talk is to start with saying a little bit about predictive processing and um alluding to a move towards presenting this framework in terms of something that we now call self-evidencing, which you might have seen around if you've read some of these, these papers out there, otherwise I'll try and explain it. Then I'll leverage the notion uh, within this self-evidencing idea of active inference, which you might also have seen in some of the literature on predictive processing. I'll leverage that partly for action, but also for perception. And then I'll try and make the link from that to conscious perception um, as uh, related to particular types of self-evidencing. And so that discharges the second half of the talk, which is trying to link the predictive processing framework to consciousness. Um, so predictive processing is this framework that um, has kind of risen to prominence in the last decade and a bit um, in various stages. Um, and I'll talk very briefly about this, in particular, the way in which predictive processing is kind of filtered through some, some philosophical accounts by myself and Andy Clark. And uh, when I did an account a couple of years ago, there's hundreds of papers in the kind of philosophical domain that speaks to predictive processing. And of course, there are, there's a lot of studies uh, in neuroscience and psychology and computational science that uh, also um, appeals to predictive processing in various ways. Um, if you've looked at this literature, it's full of images like this, uh, which portrays the brain, which is the thing that sits inside this box that's trying to figure out what the worldly causes are. Um, they're trying to figure out what the worldly causes are by sending predictioners up that are in response to uh, uh, predictions that go down, that are resolved then with some extra machinery around the precision weighting of these predictions and predictioners, which is an important part of uh, what um, uh, predictive processing um, is and how it particularly was presented in, in those earlier kinds of philosophical accounts and some of the new scientific accounts. This is a figure that has the same structure with a bit more detail, but from one of any of Seth's papers where we've got three levels, we've got some representation units and some error units, but the idea is the same, prediction errors going up, predictions going down and they're resolved uh, with the help of precision weighting as well. So this is the predictive coding framework. And we, uh, you know, littered the literature back then with this idea that predictive coding is all the brain ever does and it explains everything. Uh, so quite a modest statement. And the thing to notice about where the debate is about is nowadays is that it's predictive coding, but then it's really understood very much now. And a lot of the debate is around active inference. Uh, and so if you associate predictive processing as a framework with predictive coding in particular, then you are missing out on where the debate is. And so uh, looking at active inference is a good kind of first step of getting a sense of of the discussion as it is nowadays. And a good place to go for that is this book uh, called Active Inference. This book is available for free uh, to download as PDF from uh, MIT Press's uh, website. It's written by Thomas Parr and Giovanni Pizzullo and Carl Friston, and it's relatively readable. 
Um, they do spend some time unfolding the different concepts and putting things into context. Uh, and the prose is written by Thomas and Giovanni. Uh, active influence is simply a um, framework for planning and decision making where agents infer policies for action that they believe will minimize their expected free energy. And free energy is this weird term, um, which is really a, pro it's, it's a term from probability theory that has an analogy in physics. Um, the way you can think of it is just the expected uncertainty or the expected um, uh, totality of prediction error. Right? So you can just think of free energy as all the prediction error that's going to be there. So uh, a policy should be understood in a sense as a mapping from actions to observations. Which observations will I have if I were to conduct this action out in the world? Which observations would I have if I raise my cup of coffee to my lips? What will I observe then? And I can do this offline. I can do it counterfactually, and then I can check it when it happens. Um, so in that sense, it's really a probabilistic belief. A policy is a belief about a state transition, how my uh, states, how the observations I will make will change given uh, my model, in particular the parts of, the, of, of my model, my system that is under my control. And as I said, you can think of the expected free energy here as really the, the accumulated prediction error or the expected fit between the observations that you expect under the model, under the internal model that you have in your head, in your brain, or uh, whatever the system is that we're looking at, and the actual observations. And so here we can see this idea of prediction error minimization coming in or uncertainty reduction coming in, but in a more generic way than just talking about predictive coding. So active inference is becoming really uh, important to understand what is going on. We did talk about active inference quite early on uh, when we were trying to um, you you know trying to explain, especially the way that uh, Friston was talking about the free energy principle and predictive coding and predictive processing and so on. And active inference began to show up in papers around 2012, 2013 already. Um, and it's a useful concept uh, because then we can talk about different kinds of directions of fit um, where perceptual inference is when you update your internal states in the light of the prediction that you encounter. And active inference is the opposite direction of fit where you update the observations that you encounter in order to make them fit with the beliefs that you have. So two di different directions of of fit uh, that uh, makes sense of perception on one hand and active inference on the other hand. One good way of, of bringing this out is in, is in this kind of classic uh, action perception loop diagram where we've got the agent on one side, we've got the uh, um, boundary between the agent and the external world as the dotted line here, which often is called a Markov blanket in the literature. Uh, on this blanket sits some sensory states, uh, there are some active states, there are some internal states as well. And out in the world, there are some true hidden states that you don't know directly. You only know them vicariously through the sensory input. So the job for the brain in this case is to use the sensory input to infer what caused that sensory input. And once you've made your inference, you can then take action out in the world. So if you think that you're sitting in front of a cup of coffee, you can then reach out you can change the true hidden states in various ways through your actions, and that will give rise to new sensory input. So you got this nice circular movement where both action and perception are involved, uh, which are then understood in terms of perceptual and active inference. Um, so th this is the kind of picture that, that we use where we are kind of relinquishing a little bit this focus on predictive coding specifically and only talk in terms of prediction and prediction error uh, because there are many different ways in which you can minimize uncertainty um, than just hammering down every single prediction error that you come across. Uh, and so this will play a role in, in the story as we unpack it a little bit later. I want to now talk about this notion of self-evidencing. And so if you read, uh, for instance, the Active Infants book, this notion comes up here and there. And it's a notion um, that um, is borrowed from philosophy of science uh, from Karl Hempel and um, um, 
Peter Lipton, the uh, late uh, philosopher of science, uh, as well used it a lot. And it's a very simple motif um, where we make a very tight connection between explanations, scientific explanations, all the explanations that uh, we might form as agents in, in a predictive processing sense, and the evidence that um, is there to be explained or that occurs. And so the classic example from Peter Lipton is that uh, you wake up one morning, you look out your window, and down the flower bed below the window, there's a footprint. So that's your evidence, and that's something to explain. That's unusual. What is this? And so you come up with the explanation. You might be considering a number of different explanations, but you come up with the explanation that there's been a burglar about. That is what explains the evidence. Uh, and then at the same time, of course, if someone were to ask you, why do you believe that there's been a burglar about, you can say, well, I've got evidence for it, namely this footprint. And so you get something that looks kind of suspiciously circular, but it's actually a benign circle, argues the philosopher of science where the explanation explains the evidence and the evidence becomes evidence for the explanation. And that is then um, used in predictive processing as a kind of epistemological uh, unpacking of the action perception loop. Right? So it's, you know, this is a little bit crude, but it's an, uh, a way of uh, unpacking what it is that happens between the internal states and um, and the external states that provide the evidence uh, that the system encounters or the observations uh, that is encountered. Um, and one of the advantages of doing that is that there are many different factors that play into picking a particular explanation and considering the evidence um, for it than just here's a prediction and here's a prediction error. Um, and so you get a, a few more resources to play with once you do this. And there's a nice um, overlap here with uh, concepts from um, autopoiesis and self-organization and so on, um, where we get an epistemological um, framing of similar things. So you can start to see connections between self-organizing systems in biology and self-evidencing as it's unfolded in predictive processing. So just a few ways of um, talking about self-evidencing is the idea that we act in many different ways to encounter explainable prediction error. So we seek out things that, will, that we think will update our beliefs in a meaningful and strong way, just like an, um, a scientist in a lab might uh, conduct a very controlled experiment in order to decide between two different hypotheses. Like what is the observation that I can make that will allow me to get the most information gain. This maximizes the evidence for one's own model of the world. And if, if that model is the model that is harbored in, in the brain, then it becomes evidence for one's own existence. So this idea of self-evidencing both speaks to the idea of the circularity. It's something like a self-sourcing pudding, uh, but it's also something that uh, where the self relates to the evidence that I provide for myself, uh, at least in the way that we try to unpack this. And so this process of minimizes of self-evidencing minimizes uncertainty in the long-term average with respect to a model. And it's always important to put in this idea here that it's with respect to a model. So you look at a system, you look at what it does, and uh, you have to assume that the way that it accumulates evidence is going to be self-evidencing for it, given what its model says it should be expecting. And so a good exercise here is to consider um, what is the first objection that many have when they think about uh, prediction error minimization and predictive processing, namely that the most efficient way to minimize your prediction error is to seek out a dark room and sit in that and do nothing. Right, that's the best way of not encountering any surprise and just keep the uncertainty low. Uh, it's a famous uh, objection that a lot of people have thought of, and it has a name now. It's called the dark room problem for predictive processing. And there's a, there's a big literature on this, and it's quite interesting uh, in the theoretical and philosophy of science since what is happening here. In my view is that it's no objection at all, um, simply because if you find a creature that sits in a, in a dark room uh, for extended periods of time, it is because it's 
that is what it expects to do with respect to its own model. Uh, we don't have models like that. So we seek out dark rooms quite a lot. In fact, it looks like you're sitting in a dark room from, from where I'm sitting. Um, we seek it out when we meditate, maybe when we sleep, but then we leave it and we leave it because our expectations, um, which are generated from our internal model, um, has certain kinds of um, observations uh, that are not consistent with staying in the room for very long. For instance, that we expect to be fed. We expect to be not too cold or too warm. So we expect to earn money so that we can pay the electricity bill so that the house can be heated and so on. We have to leave the room. Um, so it's a good exercise to kind of think through why the dark room objection is not a, a very good objection to predictive processing because it really flips everything and says it's the generative model that is uh, essential for understanding why systems act the way they do. And that is really all I want to say uh, by way of introducing the predictive processing framework. Um, there's lots more that could be said. Uh, and of course, I haven't presented any of the underlying mathematics or anything like that. Um, uh, even if I could, uh, I haven't done that. Um, but I want to shift now to this question of consciousness and conscious perception, where does that fit in to this picture? Like that is what the, the topic is here and what, what your winter school is all about. You know, what is what is consciousness? And you've heard a lot of different kinds of perspectives on this. Um, I think there's something quite interesting that comes up when we think about the connection between consciousness and predictive processing, because it's, it, it in my view, it forces a particular approach to the science of consciousness. Um, so instead of kind of going straight out and formulating a theory of consciousness, and I'm sure you've talked about several of these theories, global and your own workspace theory, integrated information theory, higher thought theory, and so on, the approach from predictive processing is much more piecemeal and a kind of journey of discovery, I think, um, at least the way I see it, um, together with uh, Anil Seth. And so there's this paper, for instance, predictive processing as a systematic basis for identifying the neural correlates of consciousness, where we are essentially arguing that the strength of predictive processing is exactly that it is not a theory of consciousness. It is a theory for consciousness science, which might eventually, if it wielded in the right kind of way, could paint a picture that looks like a theory in the end, but it's really a long journey of piecemeal accumulation of, of little victories where we can model this aspect of consciousness, that aspect of consciousness. Um, and uh, in a way, I find this quite liberating as an approach. And we don't have to think about monolithic, uh, fantastic theories of of consciousness and kind of really intricate systems or new ways of thinking like in IIT or uh, or anything like that, uh, or things that might fall short of actually explaining consciousness, uh, like some other theories might do. Uh, we can just be aware of it uh, using this computational framework and see how far we get. And so I'll try to convey a little bit about this um, in the rest of the talk. So remember that, um, yeah, remember that we, we talk about this difference between perceptual inference and active inference. Uh, and when we then ask ourselves where conscious perception fits in with this, it would be natural to think that, well, conscious perception would fit with perceptual inference. Uh, but actually, the move now, and especially uh, in the work that I'm doing and, and the kind of people who are in this kind of ballpark and very interested in active inference, it seems to be much more kind of likely that if we want to say something interesting about conscious perception, we actually have to go to active inference. Uh, and this is good because you don't want to say that any kind of predictive processing is sufficient for consciousness, because then you'll have to say that consciousness is is in everything that uh, exists or everything that uh, um, uh, has agency, because we think that you know agency is explained by conforming to the free energy principle and thereby predictive processing. And in my view, we don't want to say this because it ends up in a kind of fairly um, dramatic panpsychism where we have to you know say that consciousness is everywhere. So the task is to find types of engaging in active inference uh, or in prediction and minimization or predictive processing, specific types that are most closely tied with 
what we're pretty sure is consciousness or conscious perception. Uh, and so we're taking the overall um, story about predictive processing and we want to identify particular ways of uh, self-evidencing that seems to underpin consciousness. Another way of saying this is that we are starting from a fairly modest point of view. We're just saying if if there's a good link here, then active inference is necessary for conscious perception. So whenever you have conscious perception, you're going to have some active inference, is the view. That's the starting point. It's not a full theory. Um, we're not talking about sufficient conditions, uh, yet there might be other kinds of things that are necessary. Who knows? Um, but this is a good starting point, uh, or so we or so we argue. Um, and I'll take you through some some steps in down this route where we say that um, it's active inference and its particular ways of engaging active inference for some kinds of systems that seem particularly relevant for consciousness. The first step we, would be to distinguish between um, active things and non-active things. And so here we have some, a non-active thing. Uh, it's a rock. I don't know if you can see it on the, on the slide. Uh, the images are taken from a nice new paper by Carl Friston and his colleagues on, on path in, integrals and strange things from uh, Physics of Life Reviews. It, it's published now with a lot of commentaries that uh, kind of unpack uh, these ideas that I'm very quickly going to take you through here. So a passive thing like this has some internal states and some sensory states or blanket states, as they're sometimes called and there are some external states to it. And so this really just recapitulates the part of the action perception loop that we saw before, but without the arrow from active states uh, to, um, to uh, external states. So this thing can't act, okay? The distinction then is when we have an active system, uh, and here we have something like a cell, um, it has some active states that can impact through its boundary states, the external states. So now we have an active system. We don't want to say that just having this is sufficient for consciousness, or we don't want to say that this is the type of active inference that uh, underpins consciousness, because we don't want to say necessarily that cells are conscious. That seems a bit strong. Another example here that I would certainly say is not marked by consciousness is a thermostat. So a thermostat has this bimetal disc that um, reacts differently to temperature when you apply heat as the sensory input, it acts in a certain way. Uh, and you can describe this as this kind of active system, right? because it, when it, it, um, it switches this contact here as a result of the movement of the bimetal disc, it changes then the external states in a way that then feeds around and changes the amount of heat that it experiences if we can talk about experience in this case. I don't want to say that a thermostat is, is conscious. We need to kind of add something to this to this story. And what they do, what Carl and, and colleagues do in this paper, is that they ramp it up to what they call strange things. Um, for instance, mammals like this little cute mouse here. And we have the same kind of um, constituents of the Markov blanket and the action perception loop, but we have removed something. And the thing we've removed is the arrow from the active from the actions here and back into the internal states. So if we go back to our uh, thermostat here, the actions directly change the internal states of this system. Whereas for strange things, this is the really, to me, interesting thing. We deprive the system of direct information about its own actions. And so now, if the system wants to know what it did, it has to infer it. It has to treat its own actions in the same way that it treats the external states. It has to infer it. And that then in, begins to introduce some properties that are of interest to consciousness. In the first instance, a, a kind of enhanced detachment from the world. Uh, and we know that uh, consciousness is detachable because we can dream, you know, we can shut down all the input, we'll still be conscious. Um, and there are various kinds of phenomena, like the ones we will see a little bit later, where also we see this kind of detachment. 
And it also introduces an element of a first person perspective or agency, which must be explicitly modeled within the system's processes itself, something around agency, because it has to ask itself, which were the actions that I performed given that I'm receiving these inputs. So when we move from uh, the broad set of active uh, things to strange things by removing that one backwards arrow, we get something that is a bit more specific to creatures like us and which begins to speak to some forms or some properties of consciousness. And that is really the game. Look at ways of conducting and uh, making inferences about different states that uh, line up with the properties that we all agree on or more or less agree on uh, a characteristic of consciousness. Okay, um, been talking for about 25 minutes, so I will move on now. Um, that's the kind of first step. Try to find um, uh, kinds of creatures where we can begin to see a connection. And then within those creatures, begin to ask questions about particular uh, aspects of perception and in particular conscious perception. Uh, and this has been done quite successfully by using active inference. Here's an example from uh, Carl Friston. This is one of his slides, um, which speaks to a study that came out already in 2012 about saccades, so eye movements as hypothesis testing. And so in this case, you have a system, there's an underlying computational model that minimizes uncertainty under the belief that I'm looking at an upright face, uh, which then uh, is associated with selection of uh, policies for um, checking that I'm looking at the face. So if I start down at the nose, then I'll have the policy of moving my eyes up to test my hypothesis that it's an upright face to the eye area and then moving over here, um, maybe checking the forehead a bit and then going back down to the mouth and so on. And then eventually I'll settle on the belief that it is indeed an upright face. Um, so what, what this suggests is a kind of movement where we begin to conceive as a hypothesis, conscious perception as the process of actively sampling observations under an inferred policy. Um, and I think it's fair to say that here, there's no obvious way in which um, actively sampling observations under an inferred policy must, by logical entailment, uh, lead to consciousness. It's much more of a kind of correlational approach where we say, well, whenever we've got conscious perception, there looks to be active sampling of observation under an inferred policy. Uh, so it's not a kind of solution to the hard problem, which requires that much stronger uh, connection between the two sides. And then we add, uh, as I talked about, particular ways of actively sampling observations under an inferred policy to rule out things like cells and so on that we think are not actually conscious. So this might be in strange things, like the little mouse that we saw before. It might also be in something that is now called with a technical term, sophisticated active inference, which is active inference where you infer not just what observations you will have in the future, but also what beliefs you will have in the future, uh, which kind of creates a kind of mental space uh, in, in the active inferences. Uh, it might be in things that, in contrast to cells, for instance, have both a deep causal hierarchy, so it can model causal processes over various time scales and make them speak to each other, like the initial figures I showed you of, of um, predictive coding hierarchies, and also deep parametric um, hierarchies or, or models where we have this metacognitive ability to ask questions about one's own, one, one's own beliefs. And I'll show you an example of this in a second as well. If you want this in a slogan, uh, this comes from Carl, the idea is that to consciously see something is to actively look at something. Right? And similarly for other sensory modalities, so to, um, to um, feel something is to touch, to hear something is to listen and so on. Um, just a slogan, but it's kind, of, it's kind of a nice slogan. Importantly here, looking, the active part, is the active inference part. And all active inference comes down to, at the end of the day, is 
controlling precisions on certain precision on certain input or prediction errors uh, relative to others. So if I expect to see an eye up on the left side, for instance, then I'm just turning up the precision, the expected precision on inputs from that region of visual space. That's what active inference comes to. So it's not always um, it's not always kind of overt bodily action. It's actually um, something that looks very much like attentional control that underlies active inference. And we'll, we'll kind of maybe unpack that a little bit more. If this idea is, is on the right track that to see is to look or that active inference is a necessary condition for a change in conscious content, then at least two things follow. So one thing that follows is that uh, if active looking is necessary for perceptual seeing, then we should be able to model key paradigms of conscious perception with active inference models. And by key paradigms, I mean the kinds of paradigms that we've seen a million times in consciousness science over the last three decades or so. Um, yeah, attentional blink, um, uh, backwards masking, uh, binocular rivalry, uh, different kinds of uh, visual illusions, the kinds of things that, are, that are seem to involve very specifically aspects of consciousness. The other thing that follows if active inference if, if active looking is a necessary condition for perceptual seeing, then if we can clamp down and really remove active inference altogether, then there should be no change in our perceptual state. We should be able to induce a change in our perceptual state uh, if there's no active inference. And in fact, you know, the stronger thesis here is that there's, you know, per uh, conscious perceptions just fade away if you can't act. It's very, very hard to remove all active inference because active inference um, is also uh, covert attentional states. So mental actions fall under the idea of active inference. And it's very hard to clamp down without, you know, taking the life of your participant, clamp down on all kinds of attentional states. Uh, but you can get some way towards that, towards that goal. So I'll mention some examples of these two things. Uh, both the modeling of key paradigms and then this idea that uh, action might, the less active inference you have, the less change in perceptual states you will have. So uh, one of the first examples here um, is uh, work that was led by Thomas Parr, uh, paper um, in this very, very brilliant journal called Neuroscience of Consciousness. Um, called Perceptual Awareness and Active Inference. And what Thomas did in this was he modeled both Truxler fading and binocular rivalry using pretty much the same kind of model and just tweaking it a bit um, in an attempt to speak to some core paradigms, but also to see whether there are some similarities, whether we can generalize uh, in the sense of using the same model to take on different kinds of phenomena. Uh, so trucks are fading, um, you probably know this one. This is the lilac chase. If you fix it in the middle, then these lilac um, dots should begin to disappear and you just see the chaser. Uh, there's a stable version here. You can just, if this doesn't work on the screen, which it probably doesn't for you, look them up um, if you don't already know them. It doesn't take long, just a few seconds, and these colored dots on the periphery begin to fade. It's quite stark, actually. Um, and Thomas... Um, model this with active inference um, so that you get from this array here two different conditions that are modeled one where you are forced to fixate in the middle or instructed to fixate in the middle and one where you can move your eyes freely and here perception depend on reducing uncertainty based only on beliefs about volatility and state transitions so that's that's the only the, the only things you have to play with in an active inference model are beliefs in the generative model about what is the volatility in the situation? How quickly might uh, states transition from one thing to the other thing? For instance, how quickly might things at the periphery change? Uh, and how long should you wait before you um, look again to ascertain whether that thing is still there or not? Right? So you have differences in precisions on the policies and question, should I look or not? Um, in other words, a belief that action will reduce uncertainty given the level of, of volatility that you believe uh, is there in the environment. 
So I want to move to these targets to reduce my uncertainty about whether this object is still there. And Thomas can um, write this up in a, a, a partial observer marker decision process model where we've got certain states, we've got some observations, and we've got uh, the capacity to generate these observations from the states. So if this is a, um, a red blob at the upper left, then this is what I'll see. Um, and then we've got state transitions. If I'm looking at a, a red dot now, I might be looking at a blue one later, and they're governed by policies that are selected based on the expected free energy. I've got some priors as well. So this is the, you see this as a motif. Uh, if you go to the active inference book, it's explained in, in much more detail what these are and what the underlying equations are that allow us to then generate the, um, um, the kind of simulated behavior that we see here under two different, the two different conditions, one where you can move and one where you can't, uh, and the kind of time course, and, and that can then be matched to the psychophysics that is known from the literature to give a kind of conceptual proof of concept that this kind of active inference model could be um, illuminating about this kind of phenomenon that is relevant for consciousness. Um, he then, uh, Thomas, modeled uh, binocular rivalry, which a lot of you also will know, one image to one eye, one Im another image to the other eye, and consciousness then, instead of seeing a mishmash of both, just says, now I'm seeing either the red grading or the blue grading. Every few seconds it will shift and suppress a whole huge part of the sensory input, which is actually really amazing when you think of it, that the brain makes that decision for you. I can't show you an example of this. I can show you monocular rivalry. Probably doesn't work on the monitor and the, the projector that you've got there. You can look it up again. It's, it's quite striking. You look at this thing and there are some um, vertical and horizontal lines of different colors. And after a few seconds, they will shift back and forth. So you only see the, the green uh, lines or you only see the red lines. Uh, so the brain is doing something weird here. It doesn't allow you to see both at the same time. Um, and so uh, Thomas did a, uh, a simple uh, simulation of a uh, model of this, again, with an underlying POMDP. And he can uh, replicate a lot of the psychophysical findings that happens when you start playing with the contrasts of the different eyes. And he can generate some predictions about, in this case, what, what should we expect to see of a, in binocular rivalry of a person that has a certain pattern in the trucks for fading. Right? So we hope to translate um, these overall volatility beliefs from one situation to the other to show that the beliefs about state transitions uh, are what helps govern what gets selected into consciousness in these kinds of uh, phenomena. Uh, and notice that the difference between the two is that in trucks of fading, it's overt action, it's eye movement or saccading, uh, whereas in rivalry, we have pretty much the same model, but here it's mental action, it's allocation of attention that does the work. Another example uh, that I'll uh, direct you to here uh, is based on work by Chris White, who is now in, in Sydney. Um, and he was kind of building on an idea that I had in, in the book from 2013 about the global neural workspace theory, where I was wondering what Stan DeHaan means by ignition. What is, what is that under writes ignition of a content into the global workspace. And I said, well, it might be the formulation of a policy in active inference for action. That's the, that's the ignition, because you need to check what observations would I get in different modalities if this is the kind of thing that I want to do uh, in order to reduce uncertainty. And Chris really made that an, a palatable idea, first in a conceptual piece, and then in two modeling works uh, done with Ryan Smith, where they, um, uh, where they model uh, inattentional blindness, um, like the famous example of gorillas in our midst, uh, which you can also look up. It's quite, it's quite nice, but most of you, I suspect, will know it already. They model this, uh, again, with a POMDP, now with two levels. Uh, and the interesting thing uh, that you can get from reading the first of Chris's papers here is that he then uses what is known as the process theory, which says, yep, it's fine and good. Uh, we've got these um, mathematical models 
but how does that tell us anything about brain activity? And the process theory allows you to kind of superimpose the, the POMDP onto the brain, and then with the help of various uh, theories about how these different state transitions and differences and posterior beliefs and all that, how they are actually expressed as ERPs and EEG, for instance, and local field potentials, can, can simulate some uh, neuroimaging data that we can then go back so these are the simulated ERPs. We can go back and match them, in this case, qualitatively with past um, actual EEG data. So that's the kind of next step, not just showing that conceptually it fits, but it kind of fits as well under a lot of assumptions about particular systems in the process theory uh, with what we see. Um, in the next paper, then Chris asked about um, the difference between report and no report paradigms that you might also have heard about or will hear about, um, uh, where there's a lot of debate about the involvement of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and Chris, again, is able to, you know, provide a proposed resolution of the mystery of the involvement of uh, prefrontal cortex in no report paradigms. It's quite an interesting uh, argument that he presents for that. Uh, which is an example of you know speaking to an existing debate within consciousness science uh, using active inference uh, frameworks, where of course the difference between giving a report and no report is itself a further active inference. Okay, um, I said that the other aspect that falls out of this idea that to see is to look is that when you're not looking, you won't be seen, uh, and so we are really looking for for examples where. Uh, the less you actively look, the less you will have changes in what you see or in, 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 or even the less you will be able to see anything at all. And so um, we don't use this paradigm uh, at all, um, certainly not in this kind of painful way. So here we have retinally stabilized images um, where a little projector uh, that shows an image, in this case of a face, is um, has a little suction cup at the end that is put onto the eyeball, it's apparently it's very painful, so that whenever you move your eye around to saccade, you won't see any change in the face. Right? So in contrast to Friston's example that we saw before, where you can actively saccade around and confirm your hypothesis, you can't do that here. And so the hypothesis will be that the less you can actively sample, the less you will see, and this happens in the fading of the stimulus in this case. And there is, uh, this is a kind of qualitative argument, really, because um, it, uh, there's not a ton of research on this. And some of the later research, research that has come out shows that there's quite a lot of indi individual differences and, and so on, which might relate to attentional um, changes in kind of intrinsic active inference or mental action. In any case, it's a, an evocative example and a, and a great photo as well. Um, what we're doing here um, is playing with this idea of active versus passive engagement with uh, sensory stimuli. And we're doing that in the context of one of these adversarial collaborations to test contrasting predictions in, in consciousness science. So you might have heard about, from Liad and others, um, about the first one of these, which uh, compares IIT to global workspace theory and has done some really impressive research, uh, in my view. Um, um, we are part of another huge consortium where we are looking at uh, IIT versus two versions of predictive processing. One is kind of um, predictive coding, really, uh, and the other one is then uh, active inference. And, and our center is leading the experiments done on that um, with Carl Friston as the um, as the theory lead on that. Uh, so this is the this is the group our logo. Uh, you can you can look it up, um, and the pre-registration for this one has actually just been made public as well. What we do in our part is that we're looking at uh, motion-induced blindness, and a lot of you will have seen this one before. If you haven't, it's quite entertaining as well. So you focus here in the middle on this flashing dot, and the more you focus, uh, the more you will experience that those yellow peripheral dots. Um, come in and out of consciousness. So this happens when this disc is moving around. So it's motion-induced blindness. And there we're formulating a passive condition and an active condition, um, which I won't go into in, in detail, but the idea is that you know, 
if it's true that um, active inference is a necessary condition for change in conscious content, then when we clamp down and make it more and more passive, you should see less change in this kind of paradigm. So that's our, our prediction here. And then the other theories have, have said, no, we don't think that will, that will happen. And conversely, for the predictions that IIT has made, we have said, well, that doesn't involve active inference, so we don't think that what you think will happen will happen. Uh, quite an interesting exercise, as I'm sure you can appreciate, to be part of these big consortiums. Um, I'll mention two more examples really quickly, um, mainly just to kind of direct you in, in, in towards um, some deeper explorations of active inference for really any kind of um, very specific aspects of consciousness. So here we have work led by Lars Sandler Smith, who has worked a lot with Antoine Lutz um, and is now a PhD student here with us. Uh, this one's called Towards Computational Phenomenology of Mental Action, Modeling Meta-Awareness and Attentional Control. So Lars is very interested in meditation states and the kinds of meta-awareness and attentional control that happens there. So he's trying to model that. And he does that with a three level uh, three parametric levels of uh, of active inference. So we've got these POMDPs down here. What am I perceiving? What am I trying to do? That's the state, that's the policy. Then the next level looks down at that and asks, treats this part of the system, which is internal to the system, but treats it as an external state. Well, what am I paying attention to? What am I trying to pay attention to? Uh, how, and then moves up to a third level to get the meta-awareness. How aware am I of where my attention is? Am I trying to control my awareness? And so on. Uh, so really interesting way of wielding active inference. Uh, I can also direct you to this very recent preprint, again led by Lars, that is trying to speak more to neurophenomenology in the kind of vein of Varela and uh, Varela's ideas of, you know, and 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 um uh kind of proposal that consciousness science will focus not on what we perceive but how we perceive it on the lived experience which i think is a really nice kind of ambition to have and he talks a lot about something called generative passage and last kind of wheels that in terms of with the newest developments of the free energy principle is called intrinsic thermodynamics what is the system actually doing as a physical system within itself and the translation of that within uh, the kind of information geometry that comes with the free energy principle to what is called extrinsic belief dynamics and extrinsic because their beliefs about external states and then he wheels that into this uh, uh, self-evidencing framework where one explains the evidence for neurobiology and phenomenology which becomes evidence and then you can shift back and forth so it's a really interesting way of going about things there's a ton of papers actually now and this is uh, this one, I know you can't see it, it's just uh, an iconic way of showing that there are lots of papers from a lot of different people that's, that be, are beginning to speak to this idea that active inference is of importance to consciousness. Um, my own kind of line on this is in this paper called Conscious Self-Evidencing uh, from one or two years ago, uh, if you want to look at that. So overall, the predictive mind um, idea that we used to play with and you know, is the kind of idea of predictive processing is now more like a self-evidencing agent right? that's where the kind of debate is today i think uh, and i've tried to give you reasons to kind of take seriously the idea that um, active inference can be used to throw light on conscious perception under the moniker or slogan that to see is to look uh, thank you to everyone. Thanks to the co-authors and Chris, Jonathan, Lars, and the whole group down here, this wonderful center that we have. And, um, you know, if you come by Melbourne, stick your head in and, uh, and say hello. Thank you.